Kia ora tato. Good morning and a warm welcome to everyone. The first business commission this morning is the submission of Mr Lambie. Good morning to you Mr Lambie and uh, welcome and thank you if I may say so right at the start for providing us with copies of the excellent book about the history of the dam. We're very grateful. It's a very handsome and interesting book. Thank you. My pleasure. Now we have your submission and we have the uh, evidence statement that you've provided and this is your opportunity to speak to those two as you wish. I akanui, I akirahi, e rō rangati rama tēnā koutou. Nō te anawai aho, ko Tom Lambie aho, he kai pamu aho. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I do thank you, uh, Commissioners, uh, for the opportunity to be here in support of my submission, and I do want to just cover a brief summary, uh, but I um, acknowledge uh, your deep understanding of my submission. I wanted to just start off by picking up on one question that you've been asking a number of submitters as I've sat here or I've been listening uh, to the uh, submissions on YouTube. And um, the question is, and quite properly uh, from the previous government, is the question of Timana or Tawai. And I would hope from the book from the very first meeting of 400 interested people in Pleasant Point, as described by uh, Mr. Henderson yesterday, um, Timona, Timana Otawai has been embraced from the very start. It's been, the river has been the center point of everything that we have done. And I will qualify what I say and that I am specifically talking about the section of the river which is under the influence of the Apua Dam. And so if we look at the definition, the health and well-being of the water, and I, and I, and I welcome the fact that we have the, uh, the regulatory body in Environment Canterbury and we have the commissioners who can run an eye over and actually say, have we been getting this right? And what more improvements do we need to make? It's about the health needs of the people. And importantly, it is about the ability of the people and, the, and communities to provide for their social, economic, and cultural well-being. And I genuinely hope we are, uh, we've had that right at the forefront of everything that we've done and that um, we, we continue on that legacy today. I guess the key thing within my submission um, that I was trying to get across is you, I hope you've picked up that I really love living in this area. <laughs> Pleasant Point <laughs> is fantastic. And um, in a COVID world where um, a lot of the world is in crisis, we seem to be in this little oasis. Um, where we're actually doing incredibly well as a community and it's something I'm really proud of. I hope that everything that you've seen has been about win-win. It's about water to the city, it's about the environmental flows, it's about electricity generation, it's benefit of the irrigators. Uh, we've got an amazing added value community in Wash Dyke, uh, which if it wasn't for the high quality produce that comes from our, from our farming irrigated properties, and from the water that we provided to the city, it would not be there and would not have created all those jobs. And at the same time, we have an amazing recreational facility uh, from the behind the dam to the mouth. Um, as you'll see um, from the maps that uh, have been presented in other, in other areas, uh, we've got a spaghetti <laughs> of lake levels. Incredibly difficult to manage. And it's been amazing that through a 20-year period, uh, we've actually managed to negotiate and work with the community uh, to keep finding solutions. And I hope we continue to do that forever. And just lastly, in that really cooperative and, and things that we can do to make a, a game changer, I think, in this community at the moment is the government's COVID response. 
um, where they are um, making um, environmental enhancement gains um, a, a priority in spending. And I, I believe that we will make intergenerational gains in biodiversity and water quality improvement uh, through that uh, riparian management. Just three issues I wanted to highlight on the collaborative nature and as, we've, as we find out things that we didn't know when we started the dam. Um, the first one was the fact that the dam, when it becomes lower, stratified. Um, we worked out and found that we could uh, get a very simple thing called a pressure, um, an air pressure thing, blow in bubbles. It wasn't the bubbles, it wasn't the oxygen, it was just the fact that it turned the leg over and we solved an issue. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, making sure that we modified the, the downstream weir. Uh, we did it predominantly uh, so that we matched the flows from the spillway through the downstream weir so that we didn't keep blowing out the fusible plug. But in everything that we did, in knowledge of the freshies that we created, we knew we had to create a, a radial gate system that actually allowed us to do proper freshies because the previous um, mechanism for releasing water from the downstream weir just didn't let us do that. When I'm talking about freshies, and this is where we've got to thank we've got a lovely community and they can be quite forgiving because we sometimes get things wrong. <laughs> the first biggish fresh we did, um, we built up the head within the downstream weir, we let it go, we flushed out the fermidium and the periphyton and the didymo from below. And you know what? The mouth was closed and it all ended up in the lagoon. And it was a terrible smell. It was, I don't know how anyone ever let us do another fresh again. By a stroke of luck and genius, the community allowed us to do another one. We, were, we built up a little bit more head. We, had, we made sure the mouth was open. But the stroke of luck that we had on this occasion is that when we did the fresh, it happened to coincide when the fresh got to the sea, it was at low tide and everything that had been stripped out from above went straight out to sea. And so we didn't have all the negative effects at the lagoon that we had from the previous one. So, we, so now, we, now we understand those things and we build that into the mechanism of what we're trying to achieve. The last area, um, I was interested in a, a, a question um, around flood buffering uh, from the dam. And, um, uh, my colleague from the, the Timor City Council gave a, a, an issue a, about flood buffering to do with the dam itself and the downstream wheel, weir. The biggest issue with flood buffering is actually the uniqueness of the Opahi River system because it's a multi-stem. We're incredibly lucky to have a multi-stem river where we have a dam, but we can have the natural characteristics of the river, but we can still have storage. What the flood buffering does is that actually, when you've got a really big rainfall event, all the other rivers are flooding, but the dam is holding the water, the dam is holding the water back. And so we actually act as a flood buffer so that we might be releasing fl flood water 24 hours, 48 hours, much later. And one of the things we're doing, and again, um, we're working with Environment Canterbury, at the present time, we've got two pen stocks in the dam, and one is for, uh, uh, and a, you know, a, a bypass, uh, so that if the, the generator is not uh, is out of commission or needing repaired, we can bypass that and put it straight into the downstream weir, or we have it going through the generator. Uh, that limits the amount of water that we can pass through the dam at a time when the water level is below uh, the spillway. And so I was at the annual general meeting of the poor uh, last night, uh, management is working uh, to see whether we can double the capacity by actually opening up both paint stocks when it would be good to bring the lake lower down. So instead of 30 cumex maximum, we might be able to put 60 cumex maximum uh, through those two paint stocks. So if Environment Canterbury say, look, there's a big flood event coming, um, actually, could you really lower the lake and then we can actually capture more and save the river system downstairs and, and take all the pressure off of the stock banks. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's an incredibly multi-purpose um, facility that we have and something that I've been really proud of. And um, the last point I would like to make 
and it, it's, so it's a little bit unrelated to um, what I've made in my submission. Um, but I've had quite a significant um, career off farm. <laughs> and I've given everything up and I'm just farming. And I've never been so excited to be farming. <laughs> The, the, the innovation that is out there is incredible. Um, I was an early adopter of irrigation, so I've got an old, old, molded, outmoded system. I'm needing to upgrade it. I need to put in more standoff pads so I can protect my soil when it's wet. Um, I'm, I'm f for the first time with a young chap, uh, we're planting 25 hectares or 10% or of our um, uh, dairy platform in chicory as a summer crop for deeper rooting so we can use less water. Um, and, and, and get a better uh, clover establishment and also mitigate the amount of nitrogen that we leach from the cows. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to the COVID response and, and the government helping us do a lot more planting. And in a, a rather obscure uh, piece, um, I've also five years ago released um, ruminant dung beetles on my property. And um, I'm hoping that very quickly they'll bury the dung um, it will mean that there'll be less uh, roll off of dung, so we'll eliminate the E. coli in the rivers. And um, because they, are, they love aerating the soil, I'll have <coughs> greater capacity and therefore need to irrigate less. Um, so um, I think it's uh, an amazing uh, thing we've got. Um, I bring you back to my um, initial comment, uh, Tamana Otawai. Um, I think we've got it all, uh, but we're really pleased that you're running an eye over. Uh, have we got it right is it improvements we need to make. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Danby. There may be some questions. Commissioner Van Voorhuizen. Uh, good morning. No, no questions from me. That's good. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan. Um, Yes, Mr. Lambie actually answered the question that I was going to ask, but I do have another one. Do you, does, do you think that or OWL will produce a video that shows the release of a 30 metre fresh, for instance? I'd be really, I'd really like to see that. <laughs> I, I, I would like, and, and in this day and age with technology around drones yes. and things, we should be able to demonstrate it. Yes, I would hope we can. Okay. I'll, I'll look out for that on YouTube. <laughs> That's all from me. Thank you. Well, Mr. Danby, like uh, m many others of the submitters, you've given us a very interesting uh, opening remarks or remarks about your submission. We recognise your enthusiasm and your experience, and we wish you good luck with the chicory, and especially with the dung beetles. Thank you very much for your submission. Good as gold. And um, just when I've got the uh, the floor, I'll just take this opportunity and uh, um, of thanking you as commissioners. You've been here since the original land and water plan, and um, you've done a. You, when we look back in the history of Canterbury, uh, you will be very significantly remembered for. Um, the very significant improvements you've made in all aspects of um, water and environmental management in Canterbury. Thank you. Thank you. Our next business is the submission of Ashwick Flat Dairy Farm and Cascade Irrigation Race. And uh, good morning to you both. Uh, we have the original submission, we have the evidence statement, and we have the videos which we've looked at. 
Now, we've read the submission, of course, and the evidence statement, but that's not to preclude you speaking as you wish to uh, introduce us to the important aspects that you've raised in your submission. So please introduce yourselves and uh, proceed as you'd like. Thank you. Kia ora koutou and good morning, Commissioners. My name's Charlotte Steetskamp and this is my husband, Chad. We're here today on behalf of both of ourselves and Cascade Irrigation. Chad and I did not grow up on farm like many of our neighbours and friends. We made fairly our home 11 years ago when we got married. We took an opportunity to take ourselves way out of our comfort zones with Chad being a former PE teacher and myself an accountant in Christchurch and we would never look back. We've had the privilege of starting to raise our family in one of the most amazing parts of New Zealand, an area that we welcome you the commissioners to visit. First and foremost, I'm a mother of two children, Tom, nine years old, and Lucy, seven. I'm also an avid community member and own mo multiple local businesses while also running the busy office of our farming operation up in Ashwick Flat. And Chad is also an active community member and mostly spends his days out on the farm. We leased two dairy farms from my father, Ron Smith, who stumbled into the area, himself very green on the idea of farming in 1997. Dad gave us the opportunity to start a new business by buying our own cows in order to lease farm our family's properties. We're proud of the fact that through 11 years of hard work, we've been able to buy two properties of our own and continue to build our own farm and bring our home and business forward with current farming practices. We milk our cows over two sheds with three centre pivot irrigated platforms, which are run through shares in Opua Water Limited and come from our gravity feed system in the South Opua River six kilometres upstream from the lake. We also have a self-contained runoff block which is unirrigated and adjacent to our platform properties. In total, we run nearly 700 hectares of land, approximately 1,200 milking cows and around 300 young stock. We have a team of nine staff in addition to ourselves, many of whom have families with young children. We're proud employers and love that our staff also treat our farms as their home. With our manager being with us for over 10 years, our 2IC being with us for seven years and other staff who intended to be around for a few months have stayed for well over four years. Such staff retention numbers are rare in the dairy industry, so I guess in a way we also represent them in our community here today. We inherently disagree with step two of the approach of the recommendations and the, sorry, and the recommendations to bring this forward to 2025. What step two of the section 42A report proposes in dollar terms to our operation is a cut of about four to five staff member salaries. We're concerned at our ability to keep our people if such flows were set. I cater for 20 children at our Christmas party that we hold every year for our farms. A fantastic day we all look forward to, and you could have seen that in one of the pictures attached to my updated evidence. This is equitable to an entire class full of children at the local primary school. Removing this amount of people from a community like this in South Canterbury will have long lasting detrimental effects. Our town is currently buzzing with business and local community groups, all buoyed in part by investment of not only funds, but also the time and enthusiasm that is fostered from our farming community. One that I'm told by those who grew up in Fairley is vastly different from former times when there was a lack of investment, population, and not a bright future to the town that surrounds. Today, if you visit Fairley any day and Lokopua on the weekends, you'll see for yourselves the sheer number of people enjoying the rural town lifestyle that such the investment has fostered. As I discussed in depth in our earlier submitted evidence, there, is, there are huge social, economic and financial ramifications. And from our understanding, the intent of the review was to take a balanced approach to any changes. We feel that the recommendations to bring forward step two minimum flows absolutely go against the grain of this initial balanced approach. If balance was attained, as such has been agreed in step one, we understand and see the benefits to all New Zealanders. At step two, the incremental benefits to the ecological state of the South Opua River cannot be justified alongside the far-reaching detriment to the community. I'll now pass over to Chad, who will talk to the Cascade Irrigation Group side of our submission and who is happy to take questions on our scheme, which again, we invite you to see further to the images and videos I submitted to you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kia ora koutou. Good morning, Commissioners. As you have read in our submission, the Cascade Irrigation Group started in 1997, abstracting 630 
litres out of the south of Pua. As a fully consented self-managed system and a share between 12 family owned farms. In 2007, with significant investment, we changed from an open race system to a pipe system in order to increase environmental and user efficiency. We have a very effective system which allows us to manage our irrigation with the flow accurately and quickly in real time. I would like to reiterate that the Cascade Irrigation Group inherently disagree with the Step 2 flows for the South of Pua presented in the Section 42A report. We have earlier mentioned the financial implications for our farm, and if you multiply this by the 12 farms on our scheme, the social and economic impacts are obviously immense, as noted by expert evidence put forward by a Pua Water Limited. We believe the community will suffer to a far greater extent. There is little benefit to the ecology of the South of Pua River with far greater negative effect to the community as a whole, which we all belong to. Although it does not sound like much, I'd like to emphasise how important a loss of 80 to 100 litres will be over the summer months. As mentioned in our evidence statement, we would again like to reference last summer as an example. The current river restrictions are at 500 litres per second. During January and February of 2020, the river averaged a flow of between 650 to 700 litres per second. This allowed each of the 12 farms on our scheme to irrigate one out of four days, roughly. If we lost 80 to 100 litres, that would reduce each farm to being able to irrigate once every eight days. At the current flow al allocations, enough moisture is retained that we can barely just grow enough grass in order to feed our stock under restrictions. We use technology to accurately measure and monitor the moisture available in soils. Irrigating once a week would certainly not be sufficient to maintain pasture and grow grass to keep a profitable farm. Such changes would turn our district into a dry land with heavily reduced production as happened in the 2014 to 15 year, where stock in the dairy areas were dried off three months early at the start of March, resulting in a 30% loss in production and su subsequent financial losses. It is not profitable to, for anyone to run a farm in the state. We plan for these natural droughts and their impacts, but simply cannot sustain them year upon year. Not to mention the mental stress that such drought situations have on us and our farming friends. The flows put forward in step two of the section 42A report would indicate that every year would produce such a result. The consequences would be cat catastrophic for our community, reduced investment due to lack of profits, reduced staff members and reduced local value. I'm an active member of FORP, representing ourselves and the Cascade Irrigation Group. Cascade Irrigation support the step one flow work FORP has done by working with the stakeholder groups in the community and can see the benefits in the table of flows put forward that been, have been adopted as step one in the section 42A report. These flows are sustainable for all parties and we can see these changes will certainly show benefit in the shoulder seasons where it has the most impact, particularly when the fish are spawning as referenced by Mark Webb of Fish and Game. We'd like to reiterate that the actual evidence from Greg Ryder from the summer of 2020, that the river was actually in good health, running at 500 litres per second, even after a longer period of time, while it was quite dry. By moving to step one, we've shown a willingness to work with all community groups and improve a healthy river even further. In conclusion, the viability of the Cascade Irrigation Scheme and the livelihoods of both ourselves and our neighbours depend on the decisions before you. Our main question to you, is there a necessity to take the flows from step one to step two, given the small incremental ecological benefits being at an imbalance with the far more reaching social and economic impacts of not only ourselves, but also the wider community? That is what is at stake here. We implore you, the commissioners, to take on board the initial guidance and in coming to a balanced approach based on ecological, hydrological, social and financial impacts. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you for the uh, descriptions. Uh, are there questions, Commissioner Van Vult, uh, yes, just uh, from uh, reading your evidence, it wasn't clear to me whether or not you supported the step one increases in minimum flow 
over December, January and February, but I take it from your, you know, going from 500 to 550 and 520, but I take it from your verbal presentation this morning that you are now comfortable with that step one increase? Yep. Yep, okay, good. And I had a similar question about the pro rata restrictions uh, at 2025. You seem to be accepting that as well. At 2025, step one. Yeah, Not step bringing one. step two. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. So going to step one at 2025. 2025, yeah. Okay, and that's, I just wanted to clarify those two matters, but that's, that's all. <coughs> Thanks. Commissioner Sullivan? Um, yes, I just have one question, um, and it's for Ashwick Farm submission, mm -hmm. and it's about your fish greens. We heard earlier this week from a submitter that fish greens used throughout New Zealand are generally not as successful as perhaps they should be. It wasn't explained why, but, um, and I forgot to ask Mr Ryder this question, um, but with regard to monitoring to protect fish life within your scheme, what is monitored and what are the results? So that, that's more of a question related to the Cascade Irrigation Scheme, sorry, not to the Ashwick Flat uh, dairy farms. But oh, I'm sorry, my apologies. No, no, that's okay. So, so what is monitored from, uh, do you mean our fish getting down the fish, through the fish screen? Well, I, I wonder what is monitored, like is it all fish making sure they get through the screen safely or, and what are the results? Because um, because we heard this week that fish screens are not always successful. We've had ECAN come to look at our fish screen, um, and they were very happy with how it worked because there's a there's probably a gap of about um, oh, a foot, right, where the fish can comfortably yeah. shoot straight under the screen. Yeah, I don't know why they are not successful. That wasn't explained, but yeah, yeah. no, we have a very good fish. We actually sent a video. I don't. Did we send a video of that of the of the fish screen rotating? Right. Um, so if you look back at our evidence, you should be able to see that fish screen working. Um, it's a very simple system. The water just shoots through okay. it, underneath it. So the fish, you can actually see the fish in the bit before the screen, and they swim under it, up the river, and then they come back under it again. You know, they they like playing around in it. So do you get any monitoring results? From the We'd have to ask Ecan. I've never seen any results, no. But I mean, they come, they come and look at it every year or two. I mean, it's the same screen, and and they're very happy with how it works. We don't have any reports on hand today. No, no. I guess you would if, if the reports weren't. If monitoring showed, you know, um, if there was any effect, should they probably let you know. Yes, yes. Probably yeah. something positive there in, in itself. Mm. If there was anything um, that needed to be rectified, yeah. of course we would. Yeah. Um, that's all from me, thank you. So is it the third of your videos that you were referring to where we could see the fish? I've got the, the third video, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Um, is that the one with the bridge at the start? Uh, no, the one with the, um, the bridge is of the South Opua. So that was just... Um, oh. Just wanted to give you a, a pictorial view of the South Opua. So that was downstream, obviously, from from where our intake is. Yes. And then I, I also sent three videos labelled one, two, and three, and they were of the um, of the intake. And then I think the third one, you're right, is of the fish screen. Good. Thank you. No I'll have another look at that. Yes. Well, you've been uh, interesting and you've shown your enthusiasm and you've given us a clear presentation of your submission points and we we're grateful to you for coming in. Thank you indeed. Thank you, we're grateful for the opportunity. Thank you very much. We have Mr. W. D. O'Sullivan.
Ms. Pui. Good morning, Mr. O'Sullivan. Thank you for coming. Good we morning, have your, We have your submission and the evidence statement, and we've read those. So please uh, feel free to continue to, to uh, speak to those. Thank you very much. So I'm a director and shareholder of Glenai Farm Limited, a um, dairy farming operation founding the north bank of the Tianawai River at Cricklewood, 10k south of Healy. My son Ryan, who's presenting next, will provide more detail of our farming operation. The Otop Zone is recognised as the most water short zone in Canterbury and the potential for new water to come into the zone is limited due to both environmental and economic factors. It is within this context that I presented my submission and evidence, which addressed firstly the flow regime of the Tanawai River, and secondly the adaptive management regime for the main stem. I would like to present some key points relating to each of these. Firstly, the flow regime for the Tianawai River. Glenai Farm holds AA consents to abstract from the river originally water rights issued back in 1984. We have held shares in the Pearl Water since it became operative in 1998. We have constructed a large storage pond which is fed by both AA water and high flow BN consent. Being AA consent holders, we are part of the successfully functioning Tianawai Water User Group and roster our abstract abstraction during periods of low flow. And you heard from Mr Hawkins on that yesterday. <coughs> I have lived next to the Tianawai River all my life and farmed beside it and irrigated from it for 36 years. I have observed many years of extreme low flows in the river. Low flows in this river are not a new phenomenon and date back to pre-irrigation. Extreme low flows were talked about in records over 100 years ago, as referred to in my submission. And the river is reputed to have run dry at Albury in 1945, something that has never happened again in my lifetime. Albury is about six k's down the river from our property. <coughs> I've been a member of the Flow and Allocation Working Party since 2017, which came up with robust and well thought through recommendations to the OTOP Zone Committee. An important consideration in the, these discussions was that finding deep well water in the tributary catchment is highly unlikely. And many irrigators have spent a lot of money, myself included, in pursuit of such a source. Currently, there are no alternative sources of water. Fork generally accepted and agreed to step one restrictions being introduced in 2025, which brought in higher tributary minimum flows. However, the imposition of pro rata partial restrictions on the Tanawai will have severe consequences, and it was agreed that more time is needed to prepare for these, hence the recommendation for introduction of pro rata in 2035. 35. This will, allow not also, this will also allow us to monitor the river under step one and determine further, whether further changes are indeed warranted. Secondly, the adaptive management regime for the main stem. While not a member of the adaptive management working group, whilst the director of Pearl Water Limited, I was its representative for six years on OFRAG, including during the period uh, the 2014-16 um, water short period. Huge lessons have been learnt, including the need to respond quickly to changing conditions. So flexibility is the key in micromanaging these situations. A poor dam has now been operational for 22 years and is OTOP's only jewel on the crown. People, particularly the younger generation, accept its benefits as the new norm and many are ignorant of what the IP system used to look like. They demand more water for the environment to 
to the detriment of those who put the dam in place and who own it today, the irrigators. You heard the same story from Mr Hart yesterday, if you recall. Plan Change 7, as drafted, gives no recognition of any advantage in our affiliation by tributary shareholders, where water taken is released down the main stem of the overhead to compensate. This is surely a point of difference with anywhere else in New Zealand. If adopted, this will call antagonism, demand for share buyback, and major implications for our going forward. It will also cause major disruption to the Opahi River hydrological model that has been developed and is presently worked to. In conclusion, both the Fire and Allocation Working Party and the Adaptive Management Working Group are great examples of local people from the community working together to come up with local solutions. Something the OTOP Zone Committee has strongly aspired to since its formation. Both groups have put a huge amount of work in. Their recommendations must be adopted in the interest of the most efficient use of the limited water we have available in our catchments. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Mr O'Sullivan. Questions, Commissioner Van der Portes? Yes, thank you. I was uh, interested to read that you drilled down to 250 metres and, and didn't get any groundwater at that depth. Which 250. 250, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that you have an, uh, a dam or a pond and you fill it with AA and BN permits and you've talked about the need for time to adapt to the new pro rata regime. I note that the BN allocation for the Tiana Wai is 800 and 722 if that's already allocated, so there's not much BN water left either. What, what sort of um, mitigations or adaptations would you see um, farmers having to adopt between now and when pro rata comes in? Well, <coughs> there's never going to be any more water. So, um, options around more storage, I suppose, long term, um, is really the only op option I see. Uh, certainly nothing underneath that we, we can find. Mm. And, um, um, yeah, taking out a season may be uh, the way to go uh, into storage, but, I mean, that comes with a huge cost. Sure. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan. Oh, no, sorry, no questions from me. Thank you. Well, Mr. O Sullivan, that's been very interesting. You've been contributing to community efforts concerning the rivers and dam for decades. And uh, you're rightly uh, bringing to our attention the issues as they seem to be important and, and are important to you. So thank you very much for preparing your statements and for coming in to present them to us. Thank you. And all the best with your deliberation. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Ryan O'Sullivan next. Tino Kato Katoa. Good morning again, Commissioners. Good to see you again. Uh, before I talk to my submission with respect to the Tianawai, uh, I may be able to assist with an earlier question for, for Mr Lambie. Uh, Commissioner Solomon, the um, artificial fresh that occurred uh, the other night, and indeed most freshes generally occur in the hours of darkness when there is less chance of upsetting river users. Right. Um, having said that, we are potentially planning another fresh for uh, early next week and depending on the tides, um, the, the situation with the mouth, I mean, it could occur during during the hours of, of daylight, and a poor water does also possess a drone. That was a concession given by the board. Actually, management wanted a helicopter. <laughs> uh, so if we can capture any 
images of that occurring, sh should it go ahead, we'll, we'll be sure to um, uh, pass it on to you, the commissioners. Yeah. Great, thank you. So thank you for reading my evidence. Uh, I guess I'm the third submitter uh, submitting directly on the, the flow regime on the Tianawai, following uh, Mr Hawkins yesterday and, and, and just before my father. So I won't uh, labour the point points that we make too much. Um, however, I just do want to take this opportunity to emphasise a, a small number of points from my submissions. Uh, the, the first part of my submission deals with our farm business. Um, all the details contained therein, but I, I guess overall we feel we're a business that uses a relatively small amount of water, 103 litres a second, uh, very carefully and efficiently, which enables us to leverage you know, a lot of economic and social benefit for our community and also important export receipts for our country. Um, as you will now be aware, the Plan Change 7 draft with respect to the Tianawai deals with two significant uh, potential steps in the flow regime compared to existing. They are the Step 1 regime, which proposes to increase minimum flows mainly in the shoulders of the season, and the second step, the pro rata restriction regime, which, which is a, a material shift away from the step regime we, we participate in currently. So just on step one, I mean, that, as you know, that was a, 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 a regime that came out of the fort process, which we were willing participants in, my father being directly involved. It, it does have an impact on our water reliability. Um, and the economic analysis done by Grant Porter shows as around a 6% drop in EBIT under step one for, for, for a modelled farm system such as ours. But look, it's something we are prepared to accept in the spirit of retaining a licence to operate in our community. Ecological modelling of step one shows some reasonable gains according to Ryder's submission and Fish and Game have also expressed there is likely to be some recreational amenity value to improve shoulder season flows, which is important for uh, angling and also fish passage in the autumn time. The second step of pro rata restrictions is without question the death knell for irrigation and business viability. Uh, Mrs Kerry Johnson models our irrigation reliability post uh, pro rata restrictions at 73% and I suggest this is the lowest reliability resultant from implementation of Plan Change 7 of any of the tributaries in the OPE system. I can't really overstate you know, how much this would financially ravage our business but needless to say it has both a balance sheet and a profit and loss impact and the business pretty much becomes unbankable. H having spent 10 years in the rural finance sector I can I can speak to that with some small level of authority. Now, now one would assume that, that a change in flow regime with, with such devastating impacts for irrigators would have a profound benefit, on the flip side, to river and stream values. How, however, according to Dr Ryder's submission, the, the pro rata restriction regime is expected, in his words, to have little or no impact on river ecolo ecology. The Tianawai is simply a river that can experience prolonged periods of low flow well below the minimum flows long after abstraction has ceased and has always been that way. To me therefore step two becomes a question of proportionality. You know, society does not jail someone for 20 years for jaywalking and nor should it destroy businesses when the benefits are shown to be marginal in an environmental sense. The existing alternative to pro rata restrictions, which is a step flow regime, has worked well for us as an irrigator collective and is far easier to manage on a practical basis in terms of abstracting water in blocks as opposed to a continuous scale. Granted, it may not line up, the step regime may not line up in a planning sense with other regimes or other plans, but surely solutions need to be tailored on a case by case basis when there is so much at stake for individuals rather than trying to fit everything into a tidy box. As you also are now well aware, 
we're all shareholders in a pua, and our abstraction is at least compensated for down the main stem. Decoupling is something that I spoke about on Monday, uh, wearing my pua hat, and uh, I know there's going to be some more, um, so, uh, you're going to be further briefed on, on what the implications of that are for, for a pua and the practicalities of it. Um, needless to say, um, from a poor's point of view, we're of the opinion that no good can come out of it. Uh, what, what, while we really struggle to accept step two, what makes it even less acceptable is the timing. Um, the draft plan at least gave us till 2030 to make some adjustments, um, you know, a 10 year lead in period. Whoever the authors of the Section 42 report uh, felt it more appropriate that this should be implemented in 2025, which, uh, which is really only three to three and a half years post plan being operative for us to, to make some adjustments. Um, I do, in paragraph 55 of my evidence, suggest what some of those adjustments or, or mitigations uh, would have to be in the event of step two becoming operative. Uh, they amount to downsizing our business or right-sizing it to the, to the amount of water availability, uh, building more storage on farm or potentially infrastructure solutions uh, led by a poor water. Um, giving us only three and a half years to execute any of these mitigations is, is a lot of words to describe it, but, but brutal uh, to me sums it up pretty well. Um, our existing consent to take and use water from the Tianawai expires at, in 2030. So I don't think any uh, reasonable person in the community would think it unre unreasonable not to let that to run to nearer to its full term before any major changes are, are expected of us. I'll now conclude at that point and happy to take some questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr O'Sullivan. <coughs> questions, Commissioner Van Voorhees? No, no questions, but that, I think that's been a very helpful summary of the situation with the um, Tiana Y and Table 14R, etc. So thank you for that. Commissioner Solomon? No, no questions from me either. Thank you. Well, Mr. O'Sullivan, it's been a, a pleasure to hear from you again in respect of your own farm enterprise. And plainly, your you're used to taking thoughtful care concerning your use of fresh water. We've got a, a clear understanding of what you have to say about step two. A death knell for irrigation and farm viability, and no good can come of it. That seems to be the summary of your views about step two. And concerning the pro rata, little or no gain. So, again, we're benefiting from people like yourself who've been lining up to tell us uh, about these things, and we're, we're grateful to you all. Thanks indeed. Thank you, Commissioners. Mr. Caird. Uh, good, good morning, morning Commissioners. Very good to see you. We have from you a submission and an evidence statement, and we've read those, and we'd like you to uh, speak to them just in the way you'd like. Thank you. In 1998, I purchased my first farm. This was a 58 hectare dairy farm located just north of Tamuka. Over the next few years, through leasing and a further small purchase, we expanded to 130 hectares. During these years, I also purchased a small support block located in Tocha Valley. This farm was supplied irrigation water by the Apua Dam. The original Tamuka farm had two of the three irrigation takes direct from the Happy Stream, which is a lowland stream. The third was from shallow groundwater. With the Happy Stream, 
coming under increasing restrictions in dry seasons and the talk of nearby wells becoming connected to the stream, I could see the benefits of the Upper Dam scheme and so I sold this farm in 2008 to purchase further property within the Upper scheme area. I'm now farming three properties, all located next to either the Opahi or Upper rivers below the Upper Dam. 75% of the effective area is irrigated and of that 80% is affiliated to the Upper Dam with shares in Upper Water. The, the remaining 20% irrigated under AN Water. While the Opera scheme water comes with this annual water charge and further shares we have purchased over the years have cost up to 7,500 hectare has provided us with reasonably reliable water. The other key benefit I could see with the dam and she holding in it was around consent renewal. A scheme with storage that meets the needs of the community, irrigation and environmental flows would surely allow for easy consent renewal compared to our original Tamuka farm. The OFRAG committee that oversees the adaptive management of the lake when there is a combination of the low, low, lake flows, low, low lake flows, storage or potential snow melt has made some crucial decisions at times around implementing restrictions in the best interests of the river and users. The committee also consider when best to use an artificial fresh to remove the likes of um, unwanted algae etc and re recognise that the freshes are most effective when there is also an increase in natural flows from other trip trees due to rain. Our average days of irrigation water use for the last eight seasons has been 84 days, with a range between 60 and 117. This is equivalent to applying 300 mils in irrigation per year on average. This is well below irrigation further north due to our, on average, heavier soils and our climate. Even though we have only recorded 260 mils of rainfall since January this year, the current minimum flows in the main stem, or the minimum flows in the main stem of the OPE have been met at all times due to the release of stored water. With the lake at 391 metres, 100% full in January, dropping to a low of 380 metres, or 30% in early April, before slowly, before slowly climbing up to around 60% full by September. The level was a real concern coming into the new irrigation season with increasing environmental flows required over the next few months. There's no doubt that the PC7's 2030 proposed increase of half a cubic metre average of water to the minimum flows in the main stem of the OPE would have led to an even lower lake level. The half a cubic metre lift in flows may not seem like a lot, but is actually equivalent to around 33% of the volume released by poor affiliated irrigators over a season, based on our average water use over the last eight years. Uh, regarding irrigation restrictions being limited <coughs> to a 24-hour period, it's very important to note that the water, a poor water shareholders order and take, even when under restrictions, is released from the dam as required. This means that no matter what restriction regime in place is, either 24 or two weeks, there is, either, there is no negative effect on the river flows. I take pride in developing the farms to a high standard. I have recognised since 2010, which is the nutrient baseline years, that decisions we make around how we farm and any, any infrastructure improvements we wish to make need to have no detrimental effect on the environment. In most instances, the improvements we have made have led to both easier farm management and better environmental outcomes. Reliability of irrigation water has always been the number one factor I have considered in purchasing a property. The key drivers of accessible dairy farm business are milk payout, which we have no control over, the cost of production, and there's a continuing upward pressure on the cost of inputs, and production, and production is largely influenced by the reliability of water. Reliable Supply of irrigation water is a key to economic, social and environmental outcomes for both us as farmers and our local community. Our irrigated farm systems allow for a profitable business, reduces stress for staff and owners and provides cash for the likes of environmental enhancements on farm. Our shareholding in Opal water has in the most part given us a reliable supply of water. Rules that risk the viability of the scheme and go too far for little or no environmental gain are necessarily putting this at risk are not needed. Thank you.
I didn't find rest on Apple Music. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Kidd. Any questions, Commissioner Van Vorten? No, no questions. It's very clear. Thank you. Commissioner Solomon? No, no questions from me either. Well, I thought that was an interesting and relevant commentary uh, on some of the uh, practical matters of detail in respect of the PC7 proposals, Mr Caird, and very grateful to you for coming and giving it from your point of view. Thank you indeed. Thank you for listening. The next submission is Mr. McCatterney. Mr. McCatterney present? Yes. Good morning and thank you for coming in. We have your submission, which we've read, and your evidence statement. And uh, so now we invite you to uh, speak to them. Good morning. Um, an apology from Joe, couldn't be here, my wife. Um, manage as best you can without her then. Yeah, I'll try. She's been my uh, personal secretary for a long time. So um, this isn't my thing coming to these meetings. I haven't been to one before. So I'm just going to talk about myself as a farmer and my sons and where we're going with these plan changes and the rules and the regulations. Thank you. My grandfather was a rabbiter and a farmer in central Otago. He farmed a small farm there. My father was a shearer and was able to purchase his farm, which was Waimarie at the head of the Waihe River, which flows through Geraldine. I left school in 1976 and we'd had a big snow storm in 73 which just about devastated my family. There was 350 hectares of native bush growing on that property which Joe and I now own and my oldest son is leasing it from us and I help him there. There is no carbon credits available for that native bush that we've looked after. They're telling us now that we have to fence it off after 30 years and fence the streams off. I got married in 1986 and we moved out to our Mayfield block which was dry land at the time and it had the RDR running through it. We were not able to have irrigation shares because there was none available. However, they did become available later in the years. In 1990, I got leukaemia, had nine months in intensive care. The bank put a lot of pressure on us to sell the farm when I got out, but I bought the next door neighbours instead. <laughs> In 92, we had a huge snowfall on the 10th of July and on the 29th of August after a drought. So Joe and I decided we were going back to the hill country and we bought Four Peaks, a high country run. The current people had gone broke there and there was no stock on it. They had sold their homes, the homestead off and the flatland, so we only bought the hill country run of 3,800 hectares. 
the big snow that came in 2006 was very hard on the capital stock and we were lucky we still had our Mayfield finishing farm which we put all the capital stock to. Because we had no income, it was four musterers huts and I'd mustered on Four Peaks and all of the Four Peaks range as a young person. We done those huts up and <coughs> they now have 150 to 200 people a year tramping around and staying in those huts. Um, takes four days to walk around Four Peaks Station. The huts all have showers and toilets and they take a maximum of 10. After the 2006 snow, we knew we couldn't deal with this again and the neighbouring block, Churubra, came up, which is 1,448 hectares, to adjoin the 3,800 hectares of Four Peaks. It has eight rivers, a lot of streams and 54 creeks as you walk around the walkway. It has got Devil's Peak, the highest peak on the Four Peaks range. A lot of rivers start on that place and streams and creeks. To fence them off is ridiculous when you can put a one fence right down one side which stops the stock flow through the creeks and streams. The catchment board in the early 70s had one for one subsidies. My father never had the one to put with the subsidies so on Marie the fences never got put there till I could afford to do it. And my father employed me for 12 years to do such things as fencing one side of every stream and one side down the centre of the ridges to keep the shady faces from the sunny face so you could make good stock efficiencies. After purchasing Four Peaks in Tubra, which had no stock on it, Four Peaks, we now have 14,000 stock units running on that place very productive, but they are only at two stock units per hectare over the 5,500 hectares we have. Joe and I were able to purchase other blocks as we come through the grapevine and um, we have three farming sons, very passionate about farming. I am about to get my sixth grandchild child today and I feel that these rules and regulations, when the water is crystal clear on our place, on all the streams, the trampers that walk it still swim in the rivers and still drink the water from those streams. We only have 50 hectares on Four Peaks that is flat. We had to get a consent to farm last year it's actually taken two years to get the consent from the process. $16,000 on, 354 different soil types on our place. None of the consenting officers could get their heads around that. It has got three different land classes areas because of the fact that we live at Lake Hopua, we farm the Geraldine side and we farm the Mowbray side. The Geraldine side has a 60 to 70 inch rainfall. The Mowbray side has a 12 inch rainfall. And we have about a 40 inch rainfall at Opua. Several of the creeks and streams that start are within five k's of Lake Opua. We've looked after our property. We have 350 hectares of native bush on Four Peaks as well. We have been fencing down one side of every river and putting culverts in. If the sheep are allowed, they always walk across the culverts. They don't all go through rivers as implied by the 
by the media and the Green parties. We do not put fertiliser on our rivers. We put it on the grass to grow so that we can feed our stock. I have 50 hectares that I K-line irrigate and that makes silage for the three and four and five foot snowfalls that we have to look after my stock for the winter. To restrict the flow of the $400,000 for the 52 hectares of water shares that we bought in 2008 of the previous owner does not have a, an effect on Four Peaks Station. As in Grant Porter's evidence, he states the viability of different places. Will our viability without the silage and out being able to bring our sheep down for that vulnerable part of July, August, we are unviable. So there is rules and regulations being put in place with no consultation, as I have had nobody talk to me about the way we farm. But there has been community groups that put out good consultation stuff and tried to get some things growing. But here we are, we're only just had an election and this, this government has already put new rules and regulations in and over above what you are assessing me on today. So I don't know that you're the right guys to be assessing this because it's not even stopped yet. You're assessing what we say today, but the government's got another tier above us. So where it's all going, I don't know. But I do know that New Zealand farmers only farm 37% of, of New Zealand, and the dock estate that I have on three sides of me on Four Peaks Station is ripe with weeds. We have forestry on two sides of us as well, and that is full of pigs and wildlife. And there is no regulations or fencing on the dock estates, there is no regulations on what feral animals are there. Out of our native bush we got 800 possums this year and there is thousands of possums and pigs in the, native for in the forests next door and they are just coming straight out onto four big stations. So until some of these government members learn about farming and some rules with logic and sense are talked through. I don't know where this is going. So I wish you well with your decisions, and I hope it comes to bear that we can continue farming. I would like to leave you three cards each of the Four Peaks High Country track and invite you to someday come and walk it and learn about the farm. Thank you for listening. Have a good day. Well, thank you, Mr McCasney. <laughs> uh, when you first came to us, you, you introduced yourself and said that you hadn't been accustomed to coming to meetings like this. Well, regrettably, because you've plainly got the, the right skills, you've been able to keep us entirely interested with what you've been telling us, it's all been relevant. But above all, I want to say we wish happy and healthy life to your new grandchild about to be born. That's very interesting. There may be one or two questions for you if you'll uh, tolerate that. Can Mr. Van Morten, any questions? Yes, I'm just interested um, in your um, evidence and your discussion today. You've talked about the impracticality of stock exclusion fencing on the high country that you farm. What's the typical stocking rate, stock units per hectare on that high country land in your farm? The cattle that are there graze out there all year round and so do the deer. There is never any more than two stock units per hectare. Okay. Okay, that's good, thank you.
Commissioner Solomon? No, no questions from me, thank you. Well, Mr. McCathney, it was very interesting and we valued the uh, hearing about the experience, the quite varied experience that you had during your farming life. Thank you very much for coming in. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Where will I leave these cards? Yes, please. I think that's the business for the morning, is it? Yes, that's correct. Well, we'll uh, adjourn now and uh, start again at two o'clock. Uh, is it Mr. Pierce then? Yes, that's right. I, I seem to have mislaid Mr. Pierce's um, evidence statement. W would you mind sending it to me again? Yes, I'll send that over now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>